Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG, as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books, for helping uh, to make this signature lecture series a success with their ongoing support. Besides the audience here tonight, we also have a global audience watching on the live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from the audience, either uh, at the microphones here at CG along the aisles, or if you're watching online, you can ask questions to the live chat function on your screen, and they'll be transmitted to our panel through the screen up here. Nearly 13 years ago, world leaders met at the United Nations in New York and adopted the UN Millennium Declaration, a commitment to a new global partnership to reduce extreme poverty. World leaders set out a series of time-bound targets, eight of them in total, which we know today as the Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs. Some countries have excelled in meeting their MDG commitments, while others have struggled to reach those targets. Our focus tonight is not so much on the progress towards those particular goals, though that may come up during the presentation, but rather we're looking farther over the horizon. We're now less than two years away from the NDG's target of 2015, and we're left with important questions on what should come next. What should the global development framework look like after 2015? What are the appropriate targets, and how should they be measured? We have three experts on these matters tonight, one a CG fellow, an economist, who's led a three-year three global consultation for CG on the development goals. The second, UN, uh, the second is a United Nations official whose organization will be the keeper of whatever new goals are defined. And the third is an expert on global development who's been at the very front lines of many of the toughest cases. I'll introduce the first, and he'll introduce his co-panelists. So let me tell you about Barry Caron, who is a resident of Victoria, British Columbia, and began working with CG in 2003, joining us as a senior fellow in 2009, following a distinguished career in the civil service, including, among other things, director of the Treasury Board Secretariat in 1974, assistant deputy minister of the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in 1992, a member of the OECD's executive committee and high commissioner of Canada to Singapore, from 1996 to 2000. Today, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria, where he served as a director for the Globalization and Governance Program and associate director of the Center for Global Studies. Barry's been leading CG's global development project toward a post-2015 development paradigm, which culminated in a final paper issued just last week listing the proposed new development goals. So please now help me to welcome Barry Karen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me just introduce uh, my colleagues. Uh, Diana Alarcon, uh, Dr. Alarcon, uh, also uh, an economist uh, by training, is uh, a key uh, senior officer at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the United Nations, uh, the department that's uh, in the center of uh, a multiplicity of processes on trying to determine what should succeed uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, her PhD is from the University of California. <clears throat> Mukesh Kapila, um, who I will uh, be a little bit more ruthless in teasing later on in this evening, is uh, a, uh, a medical doctor, but uh, he suffers from having been trained in economics uh, of the health sector as well. Uh, I'll explain that in a, in a moment. Uh, he also has been a senior official uh, for the British uh, uh, government involved in uh, aid and humanitarian affairs uh, in a large uh, series of countries, including uh, Sudan, uh, Rwanda, uh, Burma, Afghanistan. Uh, he has also been a senior official at the World Health Organization and uh, Deputy Secretary General of uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. He's currently a professor at the University of Manchester. Uh, the, the disclaimer with respect to economics, I think, is best explained uh, by the old joke uh, of the mathematician, the accountant, and the economist who all apply for the same job. But they come into the interview one at a time, and uh, the, interview, uh, the interviewer asks a, a simple question. The mathematician comes in first. The question to the mathematician is, how much is two plus two? 
mathematician is a little bit incredulous, looks back and responds, uh, two plus two is four. Interviewer says, exactly. Uh, with some impatience, the mathematician says, yes, two plus two is four, exactly. Interview's over. In comes the next uh, candidate. It's the accountant. How much is two plus two? Accountant says, two plus two is four, plus or minus 10%. Interview's over. In comes the economist. Interviewer asks, how much is two plus two? The economist gets up from his chair, walks around to the door, closes the door, closes the shades, pulls down the shades, and says, how much do you want it to be equal to? <laughs> <clears throat> In any case, goals. Uh, you hear some great slogans, cut poverty in half, zero hunger, energy for all. The point is that uh, global goals can have real, real impact. And uh, throughout the presentation this evening, I want you to uh, think about a couple of questions which uh, really are the essence of, 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 of the difficulty. And ask yourself the question, if, if you were delegated, if you were uh, asked by, say, the Secretary General of the United Nations to come up with a conclusion, what should we do? Because there's so much conflicting advice uh, from this, uh, as you'll hear, this maze of processes, these consultative processes, what would you do? Uh, should we have goals that um, are basically taking the existing eight millennium development goals and recalibrating them, uh, just keep the structure and, and come up with new targets for those particular goals? Uh, should new goals be attached, uh, added? Should they apply to the whole world? Uh, should we limit the number of goals, you know, for communications reasons? Um, and then ask yourself the question, since measurement's important, we'll talk a little bit more about that this evening. If measurement's important, is there, are there existing uh, data series so that you'll be able to measure progress and, and compare uh, performance over, over time over a, a series of countries? So those are, you know, sort of four critical questions. Should we recalibrate the, 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 uh, the existing goals? Should we have, or rather, than, or rather than have some new goals? Should they apply to the whole world? What's the number? You know, can we get away with 10 or 12? And uh, what about the data series? So uh, remind you of the eight development goals, the MDGs. They're up on the screen there. Poverty, eradicate poverty, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health. Then the question of, of uh, some critical diseases, malaria, HIV, AIDS, uh, diphtheria. Ensure environmental sustainability, very vague. And then there was a partnership goal that if you look at the, the indicators and targets are very, very fuzzy and have really been criticized. The eight goals were broken down into 21 quantifiable targets and they were to be measured by, believe it or not, 60 indicators. But what was remarkable in the year 2000 is these, this whole process uh, was adopted basically by 189 countries in, uh, in September 2000. And these are a set of goals that were supposed to be achieved by 2015. So I, I have uh, four or five points. There's a general rule that you should never have more than about three points because the average audience can't, uh, just can't absorb it. The intellectual caliber of the audience is such that three points is about the maximum that you can, you can communicate to people. But I've, I've had some experience here uh, at events at the Bowsley School and I've been assured that Things haven't changed in the last little while, and I can get away with seven, eight, and perhaps even nine points to this audience. So let me start with, uh, with the first one. Uh, goals matter. They really do matter. Uh, Canada is not really typical uh, of uh, the reaction across the world. In Brazil, for example, every state and uh, many municipalities, large municipalities, have 
adopted the MDGs and have, have uh, related them to their own current context. Goals matter. Uh, you'll find many uh, officials in the development assistance world carrying around a small plastic card and they, they're continually asked, asked the question of, well, if a, does a particular project or activity conform to, to these goals? There's a cliche we have that, that we've used often, which is, uh, tell me what you're going to measure and I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. People respond <coughs> to goals, so goals matter. <coughs> what we did with, with our particular <coughs> process for the CG project <coughs> was with my colleague Mukesh Kapila about two, two and a half years ago, we got together, he was at that time with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and we put together a package of, uh, of goals uh, and, and, and criticisms of the existing uh, package, and uh, we basically tried to get together a whole group of experts from a bunch of different uh, countries and a, a large range of uh, expertise. We had a second meeting with Bellagio, uh, at Bellagio in, uh, in 2011, and came up with a, a, a package. At that point in time, we said, well, we went in there saying we should have about seven goals, one of which should be a question mark, because one of the criticisms of the MDGs was there wasn't enough uh, wiggle room for individual countries. There's so much diversity across the world that surely countries should have their own uh, contribution. They should be able to, to do, to, to designate one particular area as, as one of the critical goals. We, uh, we then uh, put together uh, an inventory of all of the indicators for all of the potential goals that we had assessed. Again, pointing at uh, the point of uh, that measurement was, was critical. We uh, took this uh, package of uh, this encyclopedia, really, of all the existing indicators that were potentially available, arguing that measurement was critical. It would, it's useless to have an aspirational goal if you can't assess what progress you made. We took that uh, to the OECD in Paris and uh, had uh, some input from some 60 of their uh, experts and uh, consolidated the list somewhat. We threw out some indicators, added some new ones, and we learned a few things along the way, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, but then what we decided at, at that point in time was to be legitimate, any package we, came, we come up with has to have some, uh, some international uh, contribution, some international content. So we set up uh, partnerships with think tanks in uh, four countries. And uh, uh, to finance all this, we added, added a a third partner, the Korea Development Institute. And then we had uh, seminars in Korea, in uh, Beijing, with a Beijing uh, think tank partner, in Rio de Janeiro, Mumbai, and Pretoria, South Africa. And we learned a lot in each of these, uh, in each of these consultations. We put together a, a, what we call a special report, and we marched into New York last November and tried it out on all of the officials and to a group of uh, from the diplomatic corps in, in New York, the permanent representatives to, uh, to the UN, and bounced it off them. During that period of, during that whole process, our, our approach was, we're not trying to do your, your job uh, for you. Uh, when I was a, a senior civil servant, it was always uh, prudent to never give your boss the perfect answer. It's always good to leave some room for, for some value added for them. But we thought we'd give a good, uh, a good set of options to New York and to uh, people in the World Bank. We saw the executive uh, board of the World Bank. And um, I think we, we were quite satisfied with that. But uh, we then decided that let's pretend to answer the questions that I asked you at the beginning. What would we do if uh, everybody at the center threw up their hands and said, look, we can't figure out what the answer is, you, you decide. So we came up with a, a meeting last uh, February in Bellagio and uh, we replaced these eight goals with 10, uh, which uh, I'll talk to you about in a moment. So that was our process. Uh, third point I wanna mention is an assumption. 
One of the critical things you want to do when you're dealing with uh, international affairs and, and, and diplomacy is you want to be able to say you're not breaking new ground. You want to be able to say to the Chinese, we want a goal on rights, but listen, it's nothing new. You've already signed on to a previous international convention. Uh, it could have been 20 years ago. You may not be aware of it, but here's, here's the, the text. So we made sure that we built on existing international conventions and existing international agreements and, and tried to get language uh, from those. We also tried to come up with, uh, with, with suggestions that would adapt to change because there's a great, there's a tremendous amount of change over the last uh, 15 years or last 13 years. Poverty, for example, the, the majority of really poor people now no longer live in the very poorest country, countries. The, the majority of really poor people live in middle income countries, in China, India, Brazil. <coughs> and then um, we wanted to address some of the, the criticisms of the existing MDGs. The, uh, there are gaps. There was nothing said about a whole series of, uh, of critical issues, uh, security, resilience towards uh, international disasters, infrastructure, you know, the whole enabling environment. Anyway, um, we wanted to build on, 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 on the past, uh, past language. We wanted to adapt to changes uh, in the environment, and we wanted to uh, address these gaps. Well, sitting back, if you assess all that, you try and absorb all that, uh, we, we characterize it, uh, the title of our last report, Squaring the Circle. Basically, this is a really worthy problem. It's a very complex problem. Um, how are we going to square this circle? It's really complicated. We have to limit the number of goals. This is the first point uh, of my fourth section here. We have to limit the number of goals. If you're, uh, if you're Fred Kuntz or, or in charge of communication, uh, you, you can't accept two dozen goals or three dozen goals. So that means that you have to basically choose among your children. What are you going to uh, include? What are you going to leave out? There are all kinds of things that, uh, that we decided to leave out for, for various reasons. There's nothing wrong with them. They're important issues, but we have, there, it's a question of priorities. You know, there's another cliche, which is that if everything is a priority, nothing's a priority. So one of the first complexities is we have to limit the number of goals. Second, uh, we've got to be able to measure them, as I've said before. Well, what are you going to measure? Some of the uh, existing uh, goals used inputs. We have to measure inputs. Um, other people say inputs are irrelevant. You should be measuring outputs. See, an input, for example, in education, primary enrollment, was uh, in Ghana elementary uh, education. We were told uh, by our Ghanaian uh, colleague that sure, sure, we, we met the enrollment goal. The way we did it was we split the school day in half. We had shifts. The kids came in for a couple of hours in the morning. They went home. Another cohort came in in the afternoon. You know, uh, it's just not, not satisfactory. Then there's the question, well, what about outputs? Even if we had the proper inputs, what about outputs? Did they graduate? Did they complete school? Well, you know what happens? People respond to incentives. If, if that's your only measure, if all you're going to do is an output indicator, well, the, all the principles will graduate everybody. Standards will fall. Uh, what about processes? You know, what about the question of training teachers, how, how good the, the teacher core is or the, or the materials that uh, the children have. And then finally, there's the question of outcomes. You know, can we really come up with tests to see what competencies uh, emerge from all this? So selecting indicators is a difficult question. What are you going to select? Because uh, again, for any particular goal, you can't have more than, you know, three, four, five uh, indicators. And then, of course, we have to use the best available data. Now here, uh, you know, there's administrative data series. Uh, early in my career, I happened to, to have the opportunity to work at Statistics Canada. 
And that's where I learned that statistics, statistics are like sausages. I often say you like them better if you don't know what's in them. Um, you know, what do we do? Uh, what about these statistics? In many cases, people use indices. Well, they're very complex. They have different weights. Um, it's not really transparent. We don't know if the results are robust, if the, uh, the, the results change if you change the weights. Nobody really looks very carefully at the weights. It's a, it's a difficult problem. So how do, we, how do we use the best available data? It's, it's complicated. In any case, our answer, uh, moving on to my next uh, major point, uh, with seven subpoints, I think. My, our answer was, okay, first of all, we, want, we, are, we don't want to have a simple recalibration. We are going to have universal one world goals, going to apply to everybody. Uh, it's going to apply to developing, emerging, and developing uh, countries. One world goals, same for everybody. This is not very popular uh, amongst the Bangladeshis or very poor countries who feel that uh, their priorities are being diluted. The attention to them is being uh, diverted somewhere else. Um, we decided that, uh, you may remember last year there was a major Universal Global Conference in Rio de Janeiro, Rio Plus 20 it was called, on sustainability. And they, one of the conclusions was there ought to be sustainability goals. Uh, our recommendation is there can't be two processes. There can't be post-2015 goals and another set of sustainability goals. They're going to have to be merged. Um, third, the structure, in addition to dealing with individual endowments like people's health, education, or income, or employment, we have to deal with things like uh, collective human capital. We have to deal with infrastructure, for example. We call it connectivity. Uh, one of our goals is uh, in the connectivity uh, area is has to include access to electricity, connectedness to electricity, to power, to transportation, uh, as an example. In addition, uh, we argued you've got to have uh, enabling environments. There has to be something on, on global uh, governance. Um, global goals in such a diverse world seems to be a contradiction in, in, in terms. One world goals in, in this very, very diverse world. What we uh, proposed was that once you selected the goals and you had a range of, of indicators to measure them, the actual targets should be set by individual countries. You know, in the, well, some of the most uh, successful performers in, in uh, in absolute terms, started off at a very uh, primitive level. And while they might have had a very great promotion, proportional uh, increase in, in, uh, in, in a particular indicator, it looks uh, they, they didn't make enough progress to, to meet the, the global target. That, the, the targets in, for them is, the global target was basically unrealistic. Uh, so we suggest that, okay, targets have to be uh, determined by individual countries and then uh, and adapt it to their own local context. And we'll come to the question of global minimum standards. You can still have a global minimum standard. And then we change the, um, the Millennium Development Goal uh, for poverty re-adication. We argued that we have to have something called inclusive growth because if you're just talking about poverty re eradication and you leave out growth, you're basically asking people to redistribute. You're better off, it's a lot easier to redistribute a growing pie than a uh, constant sized pie. So on balance, we uh, recommended new goals for food security, which was sort of lost in, in poverty er eradication. We wanted communities uh, resilient to natural and man-made disasters. We wanted uh, goals for security and rights, for global governance and connectivity. Uh, for infrastructure uh, is the connectivity one. And the rights one, uh, as you'll we'll see in, in the discussion later this evening, is, is particularly uh, controversial. I think at this point uh, I'm going to sit down and uh, ask a few questions of some people who are wiser than I am. But first, to give you a, an understanding of the context, 
and why this is a, a complex and worthy problem, I'd like you to, uh, to get a little understanding of, of the processes that are underway at the United Nations uh, to try and uh, come up with a consensus on what should replace the Millennium Development Goals. So my colleague Diana, uh, as I mentioned, the senior officer at the center of the spider's web at the United Nations on this topic, at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Diana, please uh, give us a few minutes and tell us about the process. Tell you about the process and uh, perhaps a little bit about what is at stake in, in this process. Uh, but first I will thank CG and uh, Barry for the organization of, uh, of this event and for the opportunity to be here and discuss some of the ideas that um, are part of a very lively discussion uh, around the world. I want us to think for a second what the implications of this discussion are, because uh, this is perhaps the most interesting part of the, of the discussion. Um, as Barry said in the year 2000, governments in the United States by consensus adopted the Millennium Declaration, which was a visionary document that proposed a new uh, world in the, at the beginning of, of the millennium where we would eradicate uh, hunger and poverty, improve education, improve the health of citizens, improve uh, gender equality, and all these other uh, goals that Barry had uh, in the screen. I think we have uh, gone a long way in these 13 years of the Millennium Development Goals in achieving some of those results. But the question that we have now in the year 2015, which is the, uh, the year when the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the target year for the Millennium Development Goals, the, the question that we have now is, what are the development challenge, challenges of the world today? And what do we need to do collectively to address those challenges? So some of the issues that we started by doing at the beginning of the millennium have not gone away. Extreme poverty is still a reality for many people around the world. Uh, around 800 million people still do not have enough food to eat on a daily basis. There is still a problem of hunger. Not all children are at school. Uh, we still have major deficits in terms of basic human development, what we call human development. But there is another dimension to the discussion nowadays, which is environmental sustainability, sustainable use of our natural resources. For the first time globally, we are being aware that our Earth is not infinite, that we have to make sustainable use of what we have if we want to keep life in this Earth. And so a large part of the discussion uh, in New York nowadays within the United Nations is how can we advance human development within the boundaries of this planet Earth in a way that is sustainable and we will be able to reach equity not only for this generation, but also for future generations. We're going to leave a planet for our children and, gra and grandchildren, which is sustainable. And this is what is behind the discussion nowadays. These are very exciting times because we have an opportunity once again to define a global agenda for development that will hopefully speak to everyone and will be able to galvanize collective action to address the many challenges that we have in the world. And in that sense, we want to have a development agenda which is universal. If you saw the goals that Barry had on the screen, the Millennium Development Goals, they were basically uh, uh, targets or goals that addressed uh, issues for developing countries, for poor developing countries. We were talking about extreme poverty, we were talking about hunger, we were talking about primary education. If you are in Canada, primary education may not be the number one priority because there is pretty close to universal primary education for, our, for, for your children, but perhaps Science, the development of science and technology is a more challenging issue. Issues of uh, sustainability in the use of natural resources is, uh, is a priority. So this time around, because of the nature of the challenges, the development challenges that we have, we need to uh, talk about an agenda which is universal, that is able to mobilize 
collective action to address the problems that we have. And that is the difficulty of it. And Mukesh and uh, Barry have had a very successful three years of consultations and thinking about what a future agenda could look like that has these characteristics. But there are many other voices as well. And in the United Nations, uh, there is a very active, active process right now of opening up the space to listen to all the many voices of people, um, academics, civil society organizations, eminent persons, uh, government officials, and just uh, people, people around the world. So Barry wa didn't want me to talk about all these things. He wanted me to talk about the processes uh, uh, of consultation that are taking place. And uh, just very briefly, um, as part of the Rio Plus 20 conference on sustainable development that Barry referred to, there is now a group of 30 government representatives. It's called the Open Working Group that is discussing uh, a set or the, the definition of a set of sustainable development goals for the world as a whole. This is something that is taking place right now, and the discussions will go all the way to uh, uh, February of next year. There are 70 countries, developing countries mainly, that are engaged in very active consultations about what is the world that they want uh, in the future, in the next 15 years. So 70 countries are discussing what should be the content, what should be the characteristics of a development agenda uh, after the year 2015. There is a high-level panel that is co-chaired by the Prime Minister of the UK, the President of Liberia, and the President of Indonesia, but it is a high-level panel of eminent persons, 26 people, thinking about a proposal, a suggestion, for a development agenda after the year 2015. And there are all kinds of uh, thematic consultations, academic, civil society organizations that are being part, even uh, internet uh, consultations that are taking part of trying to identify what are the issues of priority for people and what should be part, what should be included in a global development agenda after 2015. So this is just an overview of what is happening around the world and what is happening in the United Nations at this point. Mukesh. Barry. Mukesh has uh, uh, had the very interesting experience with me uh, three years ago or so we uh, had in mind we wanted to do something about uh, contributing to the process of post-2015 goals. So we walked, we, we basically shopped around uh, a, a number of foundations and, and funders the proposal that we would put together uh, a really uh, high-tech consultative process to in, ensure that the people who are the targets of all this, you know, especially poor people and around the world uh, that they would uh, have a say. And we, we had this interesting uh, proposal which involved telecommunications companies providing uh, cell phone uh, polling capacity uh, around the world and we were trying to figure out how to, how to tra get this stuff translated and uh, it has to be culturally uh, relevant. And we walked this uh, proposal around to, to see what, what do people want especially what the poor people want. And uh, the general reaction we got from, uh, from all of uh, the potential fu funders, and I have to say we, at that time, at least thought of ourselves as relatively experienced uh, and competent uh, grant seekers looking for, gr uh, for funding for this stuff. People's response was, why would you want to do that? Uh, we know what they would think. And to some extent, I guess they were right because uh, the, the World Bank did a big job about uh, 12 years ago called Voices of the Poor. They, I don't know, 70,000 people around the world they polled and, and people wanted, uh, the answers were people wanted dignity. They wanted respect, they wanted employment. They wanted personal safety. 
uh, and, and, and the funders asked us, well, do you think that the answer is going to be any different? Anyway, Mukesh and I uh, switched gears a couple of uh, years ago, and uh, our first meeting, as I say, was at, uh, in Geneva at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. So Mukesh, uh, what do you want to say about all this? Well, I think the funders did us a great favor by not having the imagination to fund this project in the way we wanted. And it made one realize that if our work on post-2015 development is to mean anything, it must be about challenging the world we've inherited and the world we want to dream of in terms of our proposals for the future. So if there is a value to these, get these goals or this uh, discussion, it is not just about goals and targets and indicators, and we will, I hope, uh, get into those in depth in a minute. But the point I want to make is that the primary question is, what is our vision of development? Uh, I was uh, involved uh, uh, from the British government perspective uh, in the late 1990s in designing the current generation of MDGs, the ones we're uh, currently uh, enjoying. And uh, the kind of insights at that time were all about, uh, you know, if you could only fix uh, uh, women's health, if you could only kind of uh, make children survive, uh, shove them into schools, bums on seats, uh, you could, uh, if you could uh, uh, reduce uh, poverty as measured in, in income terms, then uh, in a sense uh, the job of development would be done. And it would all be wrapped up by 20, uh, 2015. Love, peace and prosperity would dawn all over the world. But the world of today, and as you look forward into the future, is very different from the world of, the, of, of, of that particular time. And, we, and in our own travels around the world, in these consultations we've enjoyed in the last two or three years, and our other life experiences of uh, some 20, 30 years of uh, working in this area, it's very, very clear that what people want is not just full stomachs or uh, the children immunized, or important as those things are, but they want freedoms. They want development, the meaning of development being about, the, about dignity of the human being, and in terms of them people achieving their fullest potential, and they want equality. They want to be taken seriously, whether within a country or between countries. They want to have a say in the future. So in a way, the ambitions of what we may define as development has gone on has, it has uh, become more sophisticated. It is no longer the satisfaction of basic needs. It is about the way we organize our society, uh, in a way. So that, in a sense, has been underpinning our notion of one world goals that Barry and Diana have, uh, have, have talked about. And it also recognizes that enabling factors are as, are as important as the technical goals. So we realize, for example, that while we have made a lot of progress in many of the goals, and including health and education and so on. Where we have not made progress is what teaches most about the gaps that need to be filled. So for example, we know that uh, uh, women's health is not just a function of uh, healthcare, it is a function of uh, inequality, of power relationships in society, it is about uh, basically the way people uh, uh, treat each other. We know that domestic violence, for example, is the most uh, 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 most prevalent form of violence, far more important than uh, interstate violence or any of those forms. And all those factors we know much more, much more about. So in a way, Barry, uh, I think the point I would like to impress on our, on our uh, audience is that, it, uh, and to raise a question to them, is uh, what kind of world do you want? And what's the level of ambition that we want? Hence, therefore, the architecture that has been designed uh, in this framework. It is about having global goals at an aspirational level, and then uh, ensuring that there is space for setting the levels of ambition or targets uh, according to the specific context that uh, uh, countries are in and populations are in, measured by uh, indicators, and we might talk about uh, more of that uh, uh, in a particular moment. But uh, let me just emphasize that this is not just about a t the <coughs> technical solution to basic needs. It is actually a question of paradigms on how we relate to each other uh, and uh, the world we wish to uh, live in uh, over the next uh, generation. Diana, can you, can you uh, 
give some advice to, to members of our audience, both uh, those here and, and, and those online. Uh, there's this multiplicity of processes. Um, if you just go into the world we want, there's, there's, a, there's a provision for sending in an email or sending in your comments. Uh, you wouldn't really advise somebody to be confident that that material is going to be read at the highest levels uh, or that it's going to have any influence. It's, uh, it's a soporific. Um, what's the acupuncture point for somebody who has a really good set of answers and can defend those answers? If they want to, uh, any international, any, any of our non-governmental organizations or civil society organizations, if they want to contribute what should they be doing? Should they be going to the secretary of the high-level panel? Uh, most people aren't going to think that the most likely uh, avenue is going to Ottawa and speaking to our representatives there. What uh, what should people do if they really want to have if they have a a good idea? Um, that is a difficult question, Barry. And you know there is not a simple answer to the question. And Part of the reason is we are fortunately still early in the process in the sense that this global agenda is not going to be decided until 2015. Um, it is good we have started this early, this conversation, because that will give us time to build the momentum and to think hard and to have a broad process of consultation about what people really want what are the issues that really matter to people, where and, and whom? Um, so if you ask me what is going to make, what is going to change the mind of government representatives that are going to make a decision on the post-2015 agenda, it is very early to ask that question. But what will change the conversation is broadest participation of people in expressing their views and uh, contributing to uh, look for alternatives and ways to formulate this global agenda, this vision of development. So what, ma what matters, I think, is active participation and engagement of people in the many processes that are part of this discussion. There are many people who are contributing with their wisdom and opinions online. In my world, uh, if you go to the internet and you Google my world, or if you Google post 2015, you will find several uh, websites where there are active processes of conversation and consultation about these issues. It, it does matter. I mean, it's going to be one hit among several other thousands of hits but the collective uh, participation of people at the end is going to make a difference. Uh, here in Canada, there is a process of consultation with people of civil society who are engaged in these global uh, conversations. So this is another entry point. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very active, uh, for people who write, there is a very active literature about uh, what is the future we want how to formulate a future agenda. All those things matter. There are 70 countries that are having very active consultations about what is the, the, the world we want. And the voice of every one of those people participating matters in the sense that they are, they is, they are building consensus <coughs> that are not going to be decided until the year 2015. But the process is also important. And let me add here that there are two um, there are two important outcomes of this process. One is the definition about the agenda itself, right? What are the, the, the themes, the issues that are important for people? But the second, I think, that most important uh, outcome of this process is going to be awareness, education, and participation of people in public policy. At the end of the world, what we are talking about is about public policy, national and global public policy. And something we're going to get out of this process, out of the many million of people who are participating in this process, is interest, education, and active engagement um, in the decisions that are being made, the policies that are being implemented, and the result of those policies. If we only win that, 
that is going to be a very important result. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mukesh, uh, you'll remember uh, a couple of exchanges you had with, uh, with our Chinese colleague on uh, our insistence on putting uh, rights as one of the goals. We wanted uh, a focus on, on, on human rights. And his reaction was, uh, no, 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 take that out. Let's, uh, let's talk about infrastructure. <clears throat> if you want to talk about uh, individual situations, well, let's, let's talk about inequality. Uh, actually, they surprised us, the Chinese, by, by insisting that we do uh, a little bit more about, about inequality, hence our, our use of the term inclusive in, in, uh, in our first goal, inclusive growth. They're really worried in, in, in China about the, the widening uh, gaps in, in income and the disparities across regions. Um, but do you recall your discussions with, uh, with our Chinese colleagues on rights? Uh, what did he say and, and what was your rejoinder? Well, I think uh, China and some other countries, even uh, uh, my own country of birth, uh, India, uh, politicians in those countries are wary about uh, an excessive focus on human rights because that's challenging, in a sense, the, the systems of control and governance that they have in those particular countries. And. Uh, the debate, the intellectual debate, the, the, the uh, academic debate is really about whether you need uh, human rights to make development or whether you need development first and then the human rights flow uh, from that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is a false uh, dichotomy and even a Chinese friend actually had to admit that it was. It is partly a question of rhetoric and language as, uh, 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 rather than uh, a substantive uh, difference uh, in a way. I think uh, as we sit today and we observe what is going on, the winds of change that are blowing through different corners of the world in different ways at different directions sometimes even, perhaps it is very clear that people's aspirations to actualize their, themselves in terms of having some control over their environment, their lives, their relationships at all sorts of levels, whether it is at the community level or in relation to the society around them. We are talking about rights in some way or, or, or the other. Therefore, the challenge for a constructive development framework is to recognize whether or not the pursuit of a rights-based approach to development helps or enhances the rate of progress of achievement of certain things. We know from uh, the progress that has been made with the current MDGs that where human rights or rights-based approaches have been taken, they have resulted in uh, creating a stronger enabling framework, for example, whether it's a right to health or the right to education. I think the right to education is probably the best example of, uh, mm -hmm. of the lot. And as we move into the climate change discussions, in a sense, uh, uh, the discussion about human rights and the discussion on global goods comes uh, together. This is the question of individual rights and human rights. So what our framework, uh, I think, does is to balance in a sense, the individual uh, uh, endowments that we need to live, to survive, to eat, to breathe, to, and all that, with the collective responsibilities to each other. So the debate with a Chinese friend was about really the relationship between an individual's right to get the best and the individual's obligations to the rest of society. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and I think in one sense he was right. We need to combine that. It, this is not a free lunch for, for people. <coughs> One of the most uh, interesting discussions we had uh, with uh, some of our Asian uh, colleagues was uh, our insistence. And uh, let, me, let me just back up a second. When you have any of these consultations, what you always do is you prepare a, a background paper and a, you know, a, a draft for discussion. In any case, in every one of our uh, presentations, one of our proposed goals that we wanted on our menu or list of options uh, to be discussed was gender equality. And uh, I was really uh, very interested that uh, the body language of our, uh, of our Asian friends was, oh, can't we get that off the list? Why, why don't you mainstream it, you know? 
uh, because of course you're going to ask for all, all of your indicators to be disaggregated. You're going to want to know by age or by region or by income class. Ideally, uh, you know, just the overall average isn't going to matter. You're going to want to disaggregate and you're going to obviously disaggregate everything by gender. Why do we, we, do we need uh, another, uh, another, you know, a special goal, especially, especially since we keep insisting that the number has to be limited? And we have a long list of suggestions, which uh, we can talk about uh, as well, that, that didn't make our, our list. Um, Diana, how, how are uh, some of our friends in, uh, in the governments representing, shall we say, those not so progressive on gender issues likely to react uh, to countries that insist that gender equality be on the list? What's, what's, what's your prognosis? It, it is part of a very active discussion. Uh, there is no question that gender equality will be part of a, a framework uh, of the global agenda. How is it going to feature exactly is still open to question. As I said, it's very early still to start identifying goals and how to feature the different uh, issues into, into a global agenda, but there is very broad rec recognition that gender equality has to be part of it. You are right to say um, there, are, there are governments and there are people who would like to see gender equality mainstreamed across a global agenda, and there is a reason for that. Um, women are half or over half of the population. So if there is no gender equality, there are very serious problems of inequality in all the different dimensions of development. So gender equality matters everywhere. It matters for health, it matters for education, it matters for uh, 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 access to jobs, etc. And there is a reason to uh, think that gender equality needs to be taken across all the different dimensions. But if there is no visibility to the question of gender equality in the form of a goal, a specific uh, space placed into the global agenda very prominently, there is a risk that mainstreaming means just dismiss the, the, whole, the whole question. Um, so the way we see the debate nowadays tends towards uh, featuring the issue of gender equality much more prominently than we had before. In the uh, Millennium Development Goals, we do have a goal on gender equality. But if you look at the targets under that goal, it's a very inappropriate reflection or it's a very inappropriate um, uh, um, elaboration of gender equality. It refers to education, parity between <laughs> boys and girls in education. It refers to access to employment, and it refers to representation in parliament. So it does not address the many different dimensions of gender inequality. We are hoping that this time around, gender equality is going to be much more important and is going to be part of the whole agenda. How is it going to figure? We don't know. By the way, I, one thing I should object to, I don't think this is a, an, just an Asian perspective. I'm an Asian too, you know. And uh, even in my short few days in Canada, the last two, three days, I've noticed how backward your country is now heading <laughs> and some of the changes that are taking place. The point I'm here trying to make is that... Th those, are, those are fighting words. You, you have to tell us what those... Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe I shouldn't interfere in Canadian politics. But I mean, you have to be careful these days. You know, it used to be uh, it was difficult to get into the country. You may not get out. <laughs> well, let's see. Maybe that'll happen. But the point, I think, the serious point is that... Uh, it is not just a question of uh, uh, fighting inequalities uh, in terms of uh, st battles still to be won on many issues, including gender equality, but not going backwards. And the, tre the worry there is now around the world in terms of the consequences of terrorism as perceived or financial crisis and so on is actually recidivism in behavior in terms of uh, social progress in many countries. And therefore, the issue of equality is extremely important. Uh, or, or, or I should say pursuing equality is important. Gender is important, 
because if you add up all the other inequalities that you might think of, uh, gender, is, gender inequality at the beginning of this millennium remains mm. by far, in, in pure quantitative terms, in qualitative terms, the most the significant of all inequalities. And in this respect, that it, and as you know, gender inequality is not about women. It is about men and women. And we see, for example, the disadvantages of men also in this particular area. So how we place this is extremely important in terms of the general <clears throat> philosophical struggle or political struggle for equality across society. But we agree that uh, however determined the number of goals is, be they eight, nine, ten, and then in post-2015, we agree that gender equality, you and I agree, despite your Asian heritage, that gender equality should be up there. Uh, gender equality should be? Should be there. Should be there. But can I pick quiet, up? Quiet, quiet. Hang on. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, seriously, what? No, no, no I, I, I think, uh, I mean, we had this debate when we were uh, arguing over the last uh, three years. Uh, uh, gave us quite a headache. I mean, I don't know why we have to be limited to eight or 10 or 12 uh, goals. And uh, this is in a this way... This is a man who's never worked in communications, you see. Well, well what, what I do know about communications is don't underestimate the intelligence of people right. around the world. We might, in, we might underestimate the intelligence of politicians, <laughs> and, uh, and that may be not just a Canadian issue. Uh, but the point here is that development is a complex business. Yes. Development is an interconnected business. And dumbing down and simplifying the relationships in, among the different factors that impact on human progress by trying to categorize them into a limited number of goals and saying that the world cannot think of more than six, ten, uh, eight goals is, I think, doing a disservice. I mean, you're right. We shouldn't have 100 goals, and um, you know, I agree with you. But in a sense, it's important that we don't, while we communicate simply, we don't simplify the challenges of development. Yeah. You see, every interest group, every civil society organization, has a, a, a favored goal. We, were, uh, we received uh, advice from uh, the Mongolians uh, in, in some of our consultation that in their country, the critical thing is corruption. 90, 95% of government funding uh, uh, resources uh, in, in Mongolia comes from uh, natural resource industries and uh, they're being starved of resources because of corruption. They really want to work on corruption. When you talk to the Cambodians, uh, they say the most important thing is assistance to victims of landmines. Uh, we have to have that. The other day I, I received a, a plaintive uh, email from somebody that, arg that argued, look what you've done to health. You've got it one sort of one goal only in health. Surely the, uh, the defeat of tropical diseases deserves uh, a place as a goal. Uh, the other day we were in, at a presentation in, uh, in Ottawa. A woman from CETA came over. Her file is migration. Shouldn't we do something about migration? Um, there's an endless uh, list. You suggested, Diana, that, uh, that we have 100 or so. In any case, let's, let's move on to, to the question of, uh, of indicators. Let, let, let me just say one um, brief thing here, because I think that this point, the, the point that both of you have raised, is, is a very important point. Um, a global development agenda, which is what we are discussing now, post-2015, is about setting up priorities for the world after 2015 at the expiration of the Millennium Development Goals. A global development agenda is not meant to be exhaustive in the sense of addressing every single issue that is relevant to development. When you have a long list of priorities, nothing is a priority right. anymore. One. Second, each country has a different context and has a specific challenges that are relevant to, the, to that country not necessarily to other countries, or not necessarily with the same importance as other countries. So development, as uh, Mukesh said, is a very complex process that is the interaction of so many things. It's about the structural transformation of societies towards better ways of, of being. And it, it has to do with everything. Now, how do you capture everything? It's impossible to do. That is the role of public policies uh, actions of citizens, the private sectors, investments, etc., in each society. 
So it's not an exhaustive list of everything that is important for development that we want to capture in a global agenda. What we want to capture in a global agenda are, and that's why the magic number, that's where, why we are thinking about the eight or 10 or perhaps 10, 12 goals that are become the entry points to mobilize collective actions to address problems that are relevant to all of us. Not all the problems, not all the instruments to address those problems, but just to <clears throat> capture our intelligence, our aspirations, our resources around the eight, 10 things that are priorities around the world. Mm -hmm. And that will help us then to uh, align our national policies, our individual actions towards that better world that we want, mm -hmm. uh, capturing this visionary, hopefully, Right. Uh, new agenda. Let's say a word, uh, Mukesh, uh, about indicators. We mentioned earlier that whatever goals we have, we have to we have to have a concrete way of uh, of measuring them, and that's the question of what data, what surveys, what are, what are we going to use? Uh, this is critical. Uh, I'll give you an example of one goal that we had included in our list in, in our earlier. Uh, earlier versions, uh, we had equitable international rules. The argument was for, for poor developing countries, unless the rules are fair, you know, on trade, on, on international finance, on uh, intellectual property, if the rules aren't fair, uh, we're in trouble. Um, but we couldn't really get any kind of consensus on the definition of equitable for equitable global rules. And we certainly had a difficult time uh, coming up with uh, indicators for uh, global governance, good global governance. Uh, the, the, the questions, uh, really the results in the eye of the beholder, we, we, we don't know. Um, but maybe you should say something about uh, one field that we were, were quite comfortable with where we had uh, a real, a, a real overly rich uh, number of suggestions. Uh, the health field. What, mm -hmm. what, what should we do about health indicators? Sure. I, th I think just a sentence before that is useful to clarify the terminology. You, you'd be amazed how confused sometimes people are when you're using words like indicators, goals, targets, and such like. And just to be clear, we're on the same page. So uh, we'll talk about goals, and goals might be seen as. Uh, uh, destinations that we might wish to achieve. Uh, and uh, targets are, are, might be the levels of ambition along the way to reaching that destination, meaning it might be measured at, uh, for example, the rate at which you progress towards a destination or the level of achievement that you wish to have. So indicators then are, are the, the method of measurement, the measure by which you might uh, track the journey towards your uh, destination. And in that sense, uh, uh, it, probably in all our discussions, this is the one that aroused the most controversy. You'll remember the discussions we had with the OECD in Paris, for example. Mm -hmm. And getting the right indicator is vital if we are to have a way of comparing progress across the globe, as well as comparing progress within a country amongst different uh, population groups, some of which are more or less needy on certain uh, uh, measures uh, as, we, as we deal with inequality, for example, as just mentioned. So the choice of indicators is very important. Another reason why indicators is very important is that uh, not all governments in the world are necessarily going to be uh, progressive-minded in terms of the interests of their, of their uh, citizens. There are countries in transition, there are countries where, uh, where uh, governance is, being, is still challenged, there are countries still uh, developing, and so on and so forth. So what that means, therefore, is that we need a way of uh, actually uh, going beyond the lazy or incapable governments and finding a way of uh, helping the citizens of those countries to track the progress they're making. So in that sense, uh, indicators are not just technical instruments, they are a very, very important political uh, measure as well of the way we progress. I, I think in health, as you were saying, um, uh, we are overly blessed with good indicators in the sense that uh, the well-established indicators, for example, child mortality, maternal mortality, and so on. Uh, 
at an abstract level, I mean, the t temperature, for example, the body temperature uh, is a measure, if you like, of body's health. And the way our family of indicators we've devised for our framework is to see where we can have what we call diagnostic or summative indicators. So you can measure the body's health by many, many factors. Uh, you know, you can do a brain scan, you can do a serum, uh, rhubarb levels, you can do many, many, uh, many things. But in a sense, like a temperature of the body tells you whether the body is, uh, is uh, well or uh, unwell, and it tells you at a glance uh, if someone is sick or not sick. So if you can imagine that as a way of looking at other aspects of our development framework in education and so on and so forth, and devising indicators <coughs> which will give us, in, in a summary, the state of well-being of that particular sector, whether it's education, <coughs> the environment, and, such, and so on. Luckily, what's happened in the last 10 years, and this, is, uh, 15, and this is, I think, is a legacy of the success of the MDGs, a lot of investment has gone into both uh, capacity to collect the data on which the indicators are to be based, as well as a greater understanding of uh, the uh, types of factors that feed into these kinds of uh, in indicators. The other thing we've learned over the last 10 years is that uh, we should not despise the uh, surveys. Uh, you know, normally the scientists like me, they would go in for more the hard data, you know, things you can actually um, uh, measure in a laboratory or uh, count the numbers of people participating in something. But I think social sciences, uh, and as well as communication sciences, as well as even down, right down to Twitter and so on, allow us a way of sampling uh, that judge, allows us to judge progress and the mood in a sense. So uh, one of the contributions of this project is to lay out a family of indicators for each of our proposed goals, which within those categories of indicators, if each country was to select what it wanted according to its own particular context, there would be a degree of comparability across countries and regions and allow us a snapshot at different times of the rate of progress that a country uh, is, be is, being, uh, is, is making. You've been very patient. Uh both in the room and those who are still with us online. Uh, we're open to questions. There is a microphone back there. Microphone's over there. Good evening. My name is Huda Muhtar. I'm a teacher and international education consultant. I'm amazed at how the same language you used, we use at schools for the past six years, targets, indicators, and so on. I have worked in the Middle East, Near East, Far East, England, Canada, and have a very good understanding of the system in the States. Our education, education systems all across the, talk, the countries I talked about are wonderful. If you look at the PISA scales, they're very good. Our graduates, the, actually the topics that you put here, from grade four all the way to high school, have been discussed and those kids have wonderful ideas. They graduate from high school to universities, from universities to social media, and somehow their understanding, their asking for equality hits the, very careful how I want to say it, um, brick wall of politics. I might be opening a can of worms but it is high time we understand graduating purposeful citizens is our goal as teachers mm -hmm. and as leaders. Teachers are the front lines and they are the ones who create leaders. And the question? The question is, what are you in your development um, programs? How are you targeting the politics where it gets they're compressed, they can't, even, even the young generations, they want to express some things, the G20 and so on, they're, they're suppressed. Where are your development goals? Where's all this graduating 
wonderful students, what's happening to them mm. when it comes to we'll political that. control up there? Thank you. You want to try that one? Well, wow, what a question. Well, you know, uh, I think the point you make is uh, excellent. The other thing, what you said is incredibly encouraging, that uh, there is a thirst and an aspiration in society from a very young age that they want to participate, they want to change the world, <clears throat> and that they're, taking, uh, they're not interested in taking no for an answer, and that they are also connecting across the globe through communication technologies and, and such like. This is a historic opportunity uh, for the world and goes beyond uh, cowardly politicians or self-serving uh, politicians, and of that there are plenty in the world, as uh, we know that, you see. I think what a proper development framework can do and what we hope our proposals are is in, a, in, is in a sense a liberating and an enabling set of ideas. And as Diana was saying, uh, and this is very different from the MDGs in which I was involved in developing in the 1990s, the conversation is being joined by millions of people ar around the world. So in, in that sense, it uh, shows that this time around, it isn't simply going to be an issue of a top-down process decided by a few technocrats uh, in buildings or a little deal done uh, at, the, at the last level, that in a sense, uh, aspirations have been raised, and uh, if uh, that is the case, then I think we can afford to be ambitious. So I would say that uh, the way to deal with what you're saying is to ensure that we don't lose vigilance. We continue to engage with the processes underway. Nobody can guarantee the outcome, but what we do know is that we have an amazing chance now by participating in these processes and connecting across the globe in doing so. And then one of the first and the important thing in this set of goals, which is not there in the previous development framework, is that it recognizes the importance of governance, it recognizes the importance of, uh, of uh, basically the rule of law, citizen participation, and all that kind of stuff. This wasn't there in previously agreed <coughs> frameworks. So if this is accepted, then it is a key to unlocking a lot of potential in many societies uh, around the world. Next. I have two questions. Uh, good evening. The question number one is the what is the role of the NGO in this involvement in the economy, global economy? And the second question is that in your chart in the beginning in the screen, I did see that there's eight category, but they don't, I don't see anything commitment to reduce poverty in that chart. Is it any reason for that? <coughs> you want to take that one too or? Which one? We, uh, both of them? Well, I mean... Well, I, she can do NGOs, you do the... Yeah, I think one... Okay, uh, NGOs, well, I mean, what can one say? I think it's clear that development... You're, you're speaking now as an NGO? I'm speaking now as an NGO, am The I? problem with Mukesh is he's, he's spent too much time in the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which is a hybrid organization. It's both an NGO and a government organization because it's got official sort of status and blessing in each country. It's a, it's, it's a very unique kind of, uh, of animal. This explains his uh, schizophrenia. Uh, uh, yeah, I am, I am schizophrenic. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, what I would say is that the civil society, global civil society and, and national civil society is obviously a critical partner in development. And we, the, the paradigm of development we are talking about requires everyone to uh, play their role. In other words, development is not something that governments do to their people, or it is not something that is uh, uh, you know, uh, done by technicians, uh, like you go to hospital and they develop your health, or you go to a doctor, or you go to a teacher. Though teachers and doctors pass on certain skills and knowledge, in the end, uh, you know, it is the participation of citizens that enables all this. What I would say about NGOs is uh, that uh, we are at a bit of a crossroads with them. Many of the NGOs that we're talking about, and I'll try and be controversial here if I can, uh, it, it is, I wonder whether they're genuine NGOs. Because too, too much nowadays, NGOs have become dependent on government patronage, government funding, and many of the NGOs, which are, have budgets larger than some, uh, you know, almost uh -huh. some governments even, uh, are, have become, in a, in a sense, large multinational corporations. So if you're talking about NGOs in the spirit of what I think you're talking about, which is civil society and community organization and empowerment and citizens, fantastic. If you're talking about NGOs becoming interest groups, promoting a particular cause against another cause, competing amongst themselves, winning contracts, this and that, 
then I think this is a very bad trend that we're seeing, uh, we seeing in the world. So I don't think NGOs have any particular role to play in this other than the role they wish to invent for themselves and uh, in terms of the legitimacy they earn if, uh, in terms of their client, of the clients and uh, civil society actors, uh, I mean communities around them. Let, let me uh, say one thing about uh, what I think NGOs are, are not supposed to do. Uh, I don't think we can expect the NGO community to get together, like say the, uh, the G20 does, and come out with a, a single communique uh, there was a very interesting conference here at CG about five or six years ago where we invited the heads of, I think, 15 international NGOs, Oxfam, uh, Greenpeace, all Médecins Sans Frontières, all the big ones, and uh, a couple of uh, scholars uh, of uh, international civil society, and we posed the question to them, um, the, G the G8 has given you, this is pre-G20, the G8 is giving civil society a single seat at the G8 table, so it's gonna become the G9, the ninth member is international civil society. How will you amongst yourselves elect your representative and how will you arrange for uh, their briefing as, as, as to what they're going to say? And uh, uh, that was the premise of the meeting, which was rejected uh, out of hand by the NGOs. They weren't interested at all. They each work for their own constituents, and they're going to press their particular uh, issue. On your other question, which was, uh, if I understand, uh, what are we, th where's poverty in all this, since we now call it inclusive growth, you have to look in the indicators. And we have a list of suggested indicators, which include things like the proportion of the population that, that live below the poverty line, the proportion, the, the, um, the ratio of the income and, cons and consumption of the top 20%, the top quintile compared to the bottom 20%, and several others. So you've got to look through. And the first goal of, on yeah. inclusive growth is a poverty. Relief. It is. Well, we call it inclusive growth because uh, we don't want growth just for, uh, for the top 1% or the top 10%. <clears throat> I think while, while someone else is are coming forward, let me just add, if I may, Barry, that the, uh, our notion of poverty is also evolving. Poverty nowadays is not measured just in terms of income, <laughs> but also in terms of emotional poverty, relationship poverty, and so on and so forth. And, <coughs> one, and it's very, very important in the development paradigm we are talking here about, that it's not, uh, and I'm surrounded here by expert economists, that it's not just simply seen as a drive for uh, income or one dollar or, or two dollar. Today, the greatest problems that society faces in both rich and poor country is, for example, uh, the deprivation of loneliness, the deprivation of a kind of being isolated and so on. And this is also an intergenerational thing, you know, as people get older and their families are split up and all those kinds of things. So the notion of multidimensional poverty is far more important, I think, than income poverty alone. And in a sense, the whole framework is about addressing poverty in all its different dimensions. Yes, please. Good evening. My name is Masaya Yavaneras. I'm an independent researcher. I have three questions. One is a very basic one. Is the proposal available online, the ones that you yes. have developed? The proposal is available online, yes. OK. And then the two other ones. Um, Given the, the two ongoing processes relating to the Sustainable Development Goals, consultations that are happening, mostly as we speak, there have been quite a few already, and the high-level panel, high level panel on the post-2015 uh, post-development regime, um, how are both processes interacting? Because, of course, they are related, but I don't think that's a clear relationship because they stem from different conventions. If you think of the SDGs, they're coming from Rio, Pla, um, right. Rio Plus 20, and the MDGs are coming from Monterrey. Um, how are these two processes being interlinked? I think it's a relevant question politically and technically. And then from an economist perspective, uh, I think there is a big issue of funding that has to be discussed in this framework, considering that the MDG related to international cooperation has been widely criticized and we're in a time of financial crisis and austerity from countries that normally would have provided funding for international cooperation. So 
what are your views on this? And I would like to see both institutional and maybe the more academic uh, view on this, uh, and also the, the role of the pu public-private partnerships that have been very popular uh, currently in UN discussions. Thanks. Do you want to take the first part of that? Um, sure. How are the, the various processes underway uh, coordinated? Uh, yes. Uh, you're right, in the sense that um, the discussion about post-2015 is about <clears throat> what will give conti continuity to the Millennium Development Goals. What is going to be after the expiration of the Millennium Development Goals agenda? The discussion about the Sustainable Development Goals is the discussion that came out from Rio, from the uh, Sustainable Development Conference last year, that says we need to, in, in, in the future agenda, we need to have a better balance between the economy, society, and the environment. So let's set, uh, let's decide on a set of sustainable development goals that will address the three dimensions of sustainable development. They seem like two processes, they are not in the sense that the only thing that has, that is part of the intergovernmental conversation at this point, the discussion the among state. member states, the only thing that is a, a discussion about member states is the selection of those sustainable development goals. Hmm. Member states have not Ask started you. discussing what will replace the Millennium Development Goals. So in the UN, within the UN system, there is one process right now which is a process by which member states are discussing what the sustainable development goals should look like. At some point, they will have to make a decision about how to incorporate this discussion into the larger discussion about post-2015. Are the sustainable development goals going to be part of the post-2015 development agenda? I'm sure they will be, but how exactly the discussion is going to be carried out uh, we still don't know. There is still no decision from member states. It is true around the world, and I just mentioned all the consultations that are taking place, around the world there is a very active discussion <coughs> about post-2015. All these, the high-level panel, the consultations of the high-level panel, the national consultations, the thematic consultations, are inputs into the member states discussion that is going to take place within the United Nations about the post-2015 agenda. That discussion has not started yet. Although there is a very important decision made by member states, which is the, um, the identification of the sustainable development goals that is taking place right now is going to be part of post-2015. So we are in an interim process uh, towards the definition of the post-2015 agenda, if that makes sense. See, in a sense, there is no process, there is no two processes. There is one process within the United Nations, and there is a broader discussion about what post-2015 is going to look like, but within the United Nations, that discussion has not started formally. I'll come back to your, your question on, on funding uh, in a little while, but I'd like to go uh, to a, qu a question online from Francis. How can we develop the political will? How can we develop the political will to achieve these kinds of integrated goals with real indicators? Uh, the, the reason I do this is I, I like to give Mukesh the most difficult of the questions. How can we develop the political will to achieve these kinds of integrated goals with real indicators? I think the question is uh, not difficult. Is the answer that's difficult? Um, <laughs> The question is very reasonable, and thank you, Francis, whoever you are, wherever you are. Um, in a short word, the answer is accountability. I think the political will in any area of endeavor, public policy endeavor, is whether or not there are systems in society to hold those responsible, accountable for their actions. So alongside the process that Diana has uh, eloquently described the pin, the pin cushion, no acupuncture points, mm -hmm. looks more like a pin cushion to <laughs> the, the process, um, is whether or not we can sustain public interest and develop means of accountability so that 
leaders at all levels, community, regional, national, uh, and uh, collective, can uh, be held accountable for what they do or they don't do. And there, I think we should be bold. We should name and shame. We should name and shame individuals. We should name and shame individual countries or individual political leaders. And that's what is going to generate the, the political will. And I think there should be incentives and sanctions uh, in terms of whether progress is made or not made, in a way. And so there, I think uh, the earlier question about NGOs comes in very relevant. The one contribution that civil society and NGOs can make is to ensure that, uh, not to uh, kind of trade on their own self-interest, but to ensure that uh, they are, uh, in a sense, uh, whipping up the, uh, the public to maintain public uh, discourse in this particular area. Mm -hmm. It's a question of accountability and accountability systems. Yeah. That's going to make a difference. Yeah. We have one more online question uh, from Michelle, uh, which is what does the Canadian government want to see in the post-2015 MDGs and, and how have they engaged in the drafting? Uh, I think that's a simple answer, uh, Michelle. The, uh, I think it's early days for the Canadian government. We've had the opportunity to, uh, to brief them uh, informally, people in CETA and Department of Foreign Affairs separately last fall. Um, we had a panel in Ottawa uh, yesterday and we had representatives from uh, various ministers' offices and from uh, uh, the offices of various MPs and senators. Um, the drafting of the post-2015, uh, uh, we're at a much earlier stage. Canada is represented, represented on the Open Working Group as part of a constituency. I understand you, you say with Israel and, and uh, the U.S. Is, is in our constituency. So it's early days. They'll get back to it. Let me just come back to the, the question of, of funding. Uh, I think it's a terrible error to start with raising the money, the question of raising the money. Um, this is a general problem with, with, with global public goods. You don't want to be uh, going in saying, we need this much money, you know, let's give us the money. Let's first figure out what we want to do. Let's, let's get a really articulate, persuasive case of of what the consequences would, do, would be if we got those goals. Then there's an intermediate step of figuring out exactly how much would, would various elements of this cost. And then, you know, raise the, the question of, uh, of funding. But you've got, you, you, don't put the cart before the horse. It's a, it's a terrible strategic error to, to ask for the money first. Aside from the, the entire issue that this is not an official development assistance process. You know, our whole uh, idea here is that this is a whole one world business. And I think if you look at all the development experts, they'll tell you that, look, ODA, sure, it's important. And any particular NGO can point to very specific concrete uh, accomplishments. But in the big picture, development assistance and development financing uh, is not how you get development. It's, it's, a, it's an important but very modest, uh, modest part of it. So I would advise you, here's some gratis advice if you're a civil society organization or NGO, don't put where's the money uh, up front. It's the wrong, uh, wrong tactic. Any other questions from the audience? There are yeah, there those, the whole um, oh, there's Thank there's you very one. much for the opportunity to be here. I think uh, it's great for CG to have these, these talks and it's great. Um, one comment for Maria as um, Con mucho gusto. Estoy muy agradecido de estar aquí esta noche con usted. Gracias. And um, I just saw the movie Revolution today. And that, so this is very timely because he talks all about the environment. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He did the Shark Water movie a few years ago. I would recommend that movie to everyone here. Um, he mentions one thing I, I brought out of that movie was that Regarding poverty, the UN has declared Madagascar like a permanent state of poverty. The UN feeds that entire nation or they wouldn't have food. And in the year 2045, the UN has also declared there will be no more fish in the ocean, so seafood will be gone. So in the whole, what your study is doing, I'm wondering how much uh, you're looking at environmental issues because if we don't have food in the world, we won't even be around. Like there will be no grandchildren because yeah. there's no food around. And um, 
equitable global rules, that term really frightens me because most of the world didn't create the mess we're in. So mm -hmm. I don't know how equally, you know, that would be administered. And um, yeah, it says, you know, it was regarding one comment from the movie, the countries that did not create the waste, why should they be penalized for, you know, recouping that? Um, that, that's enough, isn't it, for us? Is that three? Is that three? That's questions? a lot, but also in traveling like around the world, like Toronto has about 200 countries of the world. People from 200 countries mm -hmm. of the world live there. They're capped out, so that's why they're sending new, like the new immigrants to this area, to this KW region. We have so many people, like the world is in our city now. Mm -hmm. All you would have to do to find out what people want, and I agree with you, it's the same all around the world. You could go downtown to the working center, Queen Street Commons Cafe, and just talk to the people, and you will find out. It's, it's very simple, and I think, way, yeah, than, I think uh, sooner yeah. than later, too, people are not going to, they're not satisfied uh. with politicians. They also showed the COP16 down in Cancun, and they put the protesters in a bus, but these kids were, like, crying for their future, because there will be no future if the environment, if the, what's happening with the environment continues on, and... Um, Thank you very much. That's it. You want to take the other question and then we will take the all the questions. We have one more. Thank you for a very engaging and... Over here? There's a question over here? I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm told I can't be too uh, right-oriented. I have to do something on the left-hand side. <laughs> You've got to be equitable. Uh, I can phrase this pretty quickly. Um, the discussion was prefaced uh, with saying that we're not really talking about how we did with the Millennium Development Goals, rather how we're framing the 2015, post-2015 goals. But I'd like to know um, what lessons have we learned from the Millennium Development Goals and how that's gone and how does that inform how we frame post-2015 goals? Let me take uh, the last couple of questions and we'll see because I've been given uh, the five minute warming and warning and then the, these seats, they're really high tech. We get uh, both a, a good taser shock and, and a, <laughs> then an ejection. Please. This is not really a question. It's more of a, a comment and a I wonder one, if you please. could just speak to it. To what extent do you see issues around terrorism and a backward slide, a conservatism? Um, hijacking or offsetting progress on meeting either the current Millennium Goals or the post-2015 goals, however we frame that process. Last one. Okay, Bashir Habib from uh, Kishan Waterloo. I'm involved with a number of uh, international capacity building issues locally and uh, internationally. The, a quick question that I have is, uh, you know, you have talked about the next vision and that's what you're assessing. Right. Fantastic. But the most important thing that I believe uh, in the whole process is in the, the implementation. You know, where the rubber meets the road. In your assessment, what did you find um, about the challenges in the current goals that the leaders faced in implementing the goals? in this very uncertain world that we are living in, very complex, very ambiguous. Things are changing rapidly. And what will be, what are, are there institutions that are doing things to ensure that those skills and abilities, leadership in particularly, will be in place to sustain where the rubber meets the road to make sure that we reach those goals more effectively and efficiently. So I'm just wondering that while you are doing the sexy part, which is the visioning, philosophizing, bringing ideas together, what is being done, the implementation level when, it, when you have to do that? Okay. Thank you. One minute on the last one, then I'll try on the others. Okay. Well, I think I would say that it would be a lazy person's uh, way out to simply tell the world what to do and this patronizing. We, I think the past prescriptions about how to tell the Chinese to develop themselves, how to tell the Indians to develop themselves, and what's right for this, that, and, and the other, that's absolutely what we wish to avoid. Because it is for each society, the combination of the government and the people and the civil society and so on, to figure out for themselves how they're going to deliver that vision. And if they haven't got that ability, then 
they will get the world that they deserve. The, we want to move away from the current framework, which is that you know, the World Bank will come and give you the money and is going to put in this. UNICEF is going to come and do, immunize your, your children and such like. It is to make you think in Canada or China or India or wherever you come from uh, to figure out uh, the world you want and how to implement it uh, in a way. And if you can force this down uh, society at all levels, then I think our attempt to shape the vision for the, for the world and raise the sight of the world will actually make a difference. Because it is, that, in the end, will be sustainable. If I may answer the question a little bit, which is related about lessons learned from the MDGs, because this is one of the lessons learned that has been learned from the MDGs. And the key lesson, if there was one lesson in my 30 seconds left to speak, it would be to say that if you simply go for the quick technical fixes, then you have basically lost development. It is not the technical fixes that are important, whether it's for health or education, etc. It is addressing the questions that keep people poor, downtrodden, deprived of their rights, and, and insecure. So addressing those enabling factors, whether it's human rights, whether it's the environment, whether it is security, and so on, which is the key missing gaps in the old MGGs, which I think would be center stage in the new development paradigm. Well, I think we're, we're going to wrap up. Um... I go back to the questions I asked you at the at the very beginning. You know, do you agree? Uh, should we just stick with the existing eight and recalibrate them? Should we instead be a little bit more ambitious and try and fix some gaps? There's got to be a limited number of goals. In your limited number of goals, do you think we should have one for fisheries? Should we be have more than one for different dimensions of environment, as was uh, suggested? Uh, you have to answer that question. Uh, terrorism, should that be one of the elements highlighted in the personal security and the violence section? If so, how would you come up with indicators? What, what would you do? Uh, but the basic message is uh, get involved. Think about it. Fred, thank you. Thanks very much to our uh, panel. I'd like to uh, thank Barry, uh, Mukesh, and Diana for, uh, for their remarks tonight and for leading this discussion on the uh, future, millennia, uh, future development goals for the world. As Barry said, uh, they need to be universal, but we have to set targets by country, uh, but it has to be something that can be communicated. Mukesh made the point that we should be ambitious, be transformative, uh, that this is an opportunity to do something really uh, important for the world. And Diana made the point that the goal should be seen as a, mobile, as a catalyst to mobilize action, and she described how people, including people in this room, could have input into the process. So I think all the panelists agreed the goals uh, for global progress are important, that good ideas are welcome from everyone. It was a call to action tonight to uh, change the world for the better, and so for that, let's show our appreciation for the panel. Thank you. Someone in the audience asked tonight if it was possible to read the report and, and the details of what's being recommended. So I'd just like to point you to our homepage. This is the CG website. You can go home or, uh, tomorrow or tonight and look at it. And in the upper right corner, you see the report, the MDGs in post-2015 squaring the circle. That is a 20-page report with lots of colorful icons in it, well-designed, that describes what Barry's three-year um, project led to with his global consultations, the ideas that they came up with for the UN and you can read that there, and, uh, and we welcome uh, ideas and comments. Uh, there may be a blog about this, uh, this uh, uh, panel tonight in the next few days, and you can comment on that blog as well. So that's where you can read more about it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in this evening's audience, both here and online, uh, for attending. The video from tonight's uh, live webcast will be edited and posted to our website uh, in our online video archive. And our next events in the CG Auditorium take place on May 23rd, when Canada's former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Joe Clark, will speak at CG in a lecture entitled Leading from Beside, where he'll look at the, um, excuse me, the benefits of collaborative foreign policy, international relations that involve both state and non-state actors. And then on June 12th, CG and the Canadian International Council's Waterloo Region Branch will present their fifth, or, uh, sixth annual media panel. This year's theme, caught in the headlines, Everyday Voices in World News, will feature Doug Saunders of the Globe and Mail, Stuart Bell of the National Post, Linda Diebel of the Toronto Star, 
Alan's, Allison Smith of CBC Radio, and our most excellent moderator will be Steve Pakin of TV Ontario. Both of those events start at 7 p.m. So be sure to register for our events newsletter for information on all of our upcoming lectures. And finally, thanks again to uh, event sponsors 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Thank you for coming and a safe journey home. Polls can have real, real impact. And uh, throughout the presentation this evening, I want you to uh, think about a couple of questions which uh, really are the essence of, 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 of the difficulty. And ask yourself the question, if, if you were delegated, if you were uh, asked by, say, the Secretary General of the United Nations to come up with a conclusion, what should we do? Because there's so much conflicting advice uh, from this, uh, as you'll hear, this maze of processes, these consultative processes. What would you do? Uh, should we have goals that um, are basically taking the existing eight millennium development goals and recalibrating them, uh, just keep the structure and, and come up with new targets for those particular goals? Uh, should new goals be attached, uh, added? Should they apply to the whole world? Uh, should we limit the number of goals, you know, for communications reasons? Um, and then ask yourself the question, since measurement's important, we'll talk a little bit more about that this evening. If measurement's important, is there, are there existing uh, data series so that you'll be able to measure progress and, and compare uh, performance over, over time over a, a series of countries? So those are you know, sort of four critical questions. Should we recalibrate the, 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 uh, the existing goals? Should we have, or rather, than, or rather than have some new goals? Should they apply to the whole world? What's the number? You know, can we get away with 10 or 12? And uh, what about the data series? So, uh, remind you of the eight development goals, the MDGs. They're up on the screen there. Poverty, eradicate poverty, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health. Then the question of, of uh, some critical diseases, malaria, HIV, AIDS, uh, diphtheria. Ensure environmental sustainability, very vague. And then there was a partnership goal that if you look at the, the indicators and targets are very, very fuzzy and have really been criticized. The eight goals were broken down into 21 quantifiable targets and they were to be measured by, believe it or not, 60 indicators. But what was remarkable in the year 2000 is these, this whole process uh, was adopted basically by 189 countries in, uh, in September 2000. And these are a set of goals that were supposed to be achieved by 2015. So I, I have uh, four or five points. There's a general rule that you should never have more than about three points because the average audience can't, uh, just can't absorb it. The intellectual caliber of the audience is such that three points. Just last week, listing the proposed new development goals. So please now help me to welcome Barry Karen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me just introduce uh, my colleagues. Uh, Diana Alarcon, uh, Dr. Alarcon, uh, also uh, an economist uh, by training, is uh, a key uh, senior officer at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the United Nations, uh, the department that's uh, in the center of uh, a multiplicity of processes on trying to determine what should succeed uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, her PhD is from the University of California. <clears throat> Mukesh Kapila, um, who I will uh, be a little bit more ruthless in teasing later on in this evening, is uh, a, uh, a medical doctor, but uh, he suffers from having been trained in economics uh, of the health sector as well. Uh, I'll explain that in a, in a moment. Uh, he also has been a senior official uh, for the British uh, uh, government involved in uh, aid and humanitarian affairs uh, in a 
large uh, series of countries, including uh, Sudan, uh, Rwanda, uh, Burma, Afghanistan. Uh, he has also been a senior official at the World Health Organization and uh, Deputy Secretary General of uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. He is currently a professor at the University of Manchester. Uh, the, the disclaimer with respect to economics, I think, is best explained uh, by the old joke uh, of the mathematician, the accountant, and the economist who all apply for the same job. But they come into the interview one at a time, and uh, the, interview, uh, the interviewer asks uh, a simple question. The mathematician comes in first. The question to the mathematician is, how much is two plus two? Ma mathematician is a little bit incredulous looks back and responds, uh, two plus two is four. Interviewer says, exactly. Uh, with some impatience, the mathematician says, yes, two plus two is four, exactly. Interview's over. In comes the next uh, candidate, it's the accountant. How much is two plus two? Accountant says, two plus two is four, plus or minus 10%. <laughs> Interview's over. In comes the economist. Interviewer asks, how much is two plus two? The economist gets up from his chair, walks around to the door, closes the door, closes the shades, pulls down the shades, and says, how much do you want it to be equal to? <laughs> <clears throat> In any case, goals. Uh, you hear some great slogans, cut poverty in half. Zero hunger, energy for all. The point is that uh, global goal of their uh, experts and uh, consolidated the list somewhat. We threw out some indicators, added some new ones, and we learned a few things along the way, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, but then what we decided at, at that point in time was to be legitimate, any package we, came, we come up with has to have some, uh, some international uh, contribution, some international content. So we set up uh, partnerships with think tanks in uh, four countries, and uh, f to finance all this, we added, added a, a third partner, the Korea Development Institute, and then we had uh, seminars in Korea, in uh, Beijing, with a Beijing uh, think tank partner, in Rio de Janeiro, Mumbai, and Pretoria, South Africa. And we learned a lot in each of these, uh, in each of these consultations. We put together a, a, what we call a special report, and we marched into New York last November and tried it out on all of the officials and to a group of, uh, from the diplomatic corps in, in New York, the permanent representatives to, uh, to the UN, and bounced it off them. During that period of, during that whole process, our, our approach was, we're not trying to do your, your job uh, for you, uh, when I was a, a senior civil servant, it was always uh, prudent to never give your boss the perfect answer. It's always good to leave some room for, for some value added for them. But we thought we'd give a good, uh, a good set of options to New York and to uh, people in the World Bank. We saw the executive uh, board of the World Bank. And... Um, I think we, we were quite satisfied with that. But uh, we then decided that let's pretend to answer the questions that I asked you at the beginning. What would we do if uh, everybody at the center threw up their hands and said, look, we can't figure out what the answer is. You, you decide. So we came up with a, a meeting last uh, February in Bellagio, and uh, we replaced these eight goals with 10, uh, which uh, I'll talk to you about in a moment. So that was our process. Uh, third point I want to mention is an assumption. One of the critical things you want to do when you're dealing with uh, international affairs and, and, and diplomacy is you want to be able to say you're not breaking new ground. You want to be able to say to the Chinese, we want a goal on rights, but listen, it's nothing new. You've already signed on to a previous international convention. Uh, it could have been 20 years ago, you may not be aware of it, but here's, here's the, the text. So we made sure that we built on existing international conventions, and existing international agreements, and, and tried to get language uh, from those. 
We also tried to come up with, uh, with, with suggestions that would adapt to change because Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG, as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books, for helping uh, to make this signature lecture series a success with our ongoing support. Besides the audience here tonight, we also have a global audience watching on the live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from the audience either uh, at the microphones here at CG along the aisles, or if you're watching online, you can ask questions to the live chat function on your screen and they'll be transmitted to our panel through the screen up here. Nearly 13 years ago, world leaders met at the United Nations in New York and adopted the UN Millennium Declaration, a commitment to a new global partnership to reduce extreme poverty. World leaders set out a series of time-bound targets eight of them in total, which we know today as the Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs. Some countries have excelled in meeting their MDG commitments, while others have struggled to reach those targets. Our focus tonight is not so much on the progress towards those particular goals, though that may come up during the presentation, but rather we're looking farther over the horizon. We're now less than two years away from the MDG's target of 2015. And we're left with important questions on what should come next. What should the global development framework look like after 2015? What are the appropriate targets and how should they be measured? We have three experts on these matters tonight. One, a CG fellow, an economist who's led a three-year three global consultation for CG on the development goals. The second, the, UN, uh, the second is a United Nations official whose organization will be the keeper of whatever new goals are defined. And the third is an expert on global development who's been at the very front lines of many of the toughest cases. I'll introduce the first, and he'll introduce his co-panelists. So let me tell you about Barry Carrant, who is a resident of Victoria, British Columbia, and began working with CG in 2003, joining us as a senior fellow in 2009, following a distinguished career in the civil service, including, among other things, director of the Treasury Board Secretariat in 1974, Assistant Deputy Minister of the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in 1992, a member of the OECD's Executive Committee and High Commissioner of Canada to Singapore from 1996 to 2000. Today, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria, where he served as a director for the Globalization and Governance Program and Associate Director of the Centre for Global Studies. Barry's been leading CG's Global Development Project toward a post-2015 development paradigm which culminated in a final paper issue. This is about the maximum that you can, you can communicate to people. But I've, I've had some experience here uh, at events at the Bowsley School, and I've been assured that things haven't changed in the last little while, and I can get away with seven, eight, and perhaps even nine points to this audience. So let me start with, uh, with the first one. Uh, goals matter. They really do matter. Uh, Canada is not really typical uh, of uh, the reaction across the world. In Brazil, for example, every state and uh, many municipalities, large municipalities, have adopted the MDGs and have, have uh, related them to their own current context. Goals matter. Uh, you'll find many uh, officials in the development assistance world carrying around a small plastic card and they, they're continually asked, asked the question of, well, if a, does a particular project or activity conform to, to these goals? There's a cliche we have that, that we've used often, which is, uh, tell me what you're going to measure, and I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. People respond <coughs> to goals, so goals matter. <coughs> what we did with, with our particular <coughs> process for the CG project <coughs> was with my colleague Mukesh Kapila about two, two and a half years ago. We got together, he was at that time with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and we put together a package of, uh, of goals uh, and, and, and criticisms of the existing uh, 
package, and uh, we basically tried to get together a whole group of experts from a bunch of different uh, countries and a, a large range of uh, expertise. We had a second meeting with Bellagio, uh, at Bellagio in, uh, in 2011, and came up with a, a, a package. At that point in time, we said, well, we went in there saying we should have about seven goals, one of which should be a question mark, because one of the criticisms of the MDGs was there wasn't enough uh, wiggle room for individual countries. There's so much diversity across the world that surely countries should have their own uh, contribution. They should be able to, to, do, to, to designate one particular area as, as one of the critical goals. We, uh, we then uh, put together uh, an inventory of all of the indicators for all of the potential goals that we had assessed. Again, pointing at uh, the point of uh, that measurement was, was critical. We uh, took this uh, package of uh, this encyclopedia, really, of all the existing indicators that were potentially available, arguing that measurement was critical. It would, it's useless to have an aspirational goal if you can't assess what progress you made. We took that uh, to the OECD in Paris and uh, had uh, some input from some 60